So first, to just quickly motivate the whole thing, I've got in GHCI here a byte string with three bytes, and I uh, would like to be able to write, you know, unsafe index byte string uh, at two lets me do that. If I go up to three, it lets me Haskell lets me do that too, which is a bit fishy. And if I keep going, eventually the operating system is going to kick in and uh, cause a seg fault, saying this is really not an okay thing to do. Uh, but I really like. Uh, GHC or you know the type system to be able to tell me that these last two expressions were not safe to evaluate instead of having to wait for the operating system. Uh, so we're going to see throughout the course of this talk how to use Liquid Haskell to do precisely that. So the way Liquid Haskell works is uh, you write your Haskell code and write some specifications in our uh, specification language. You pass them to Liquid Haskell and it churns for a bit, and then it spits out either the program is safe or it's unsafe, as well as all the inferred types for the sub-expressions in your program and any specific type errors. Um, and then you, you look through that and fix either your code or your specifications and go through the loop a few more times until everything turns out to be safe. Um, but for the rest of the talk, I'm actually going to jump into Liquid Haskell and show how this actually works in practice. So first things first, uh, refinement type is just a Haskell type that's been decorated with a predicate from our refinement logic. So for example, I have here the number 50, and I said that 50 should be an integer that is precisely equal to 50. Um, and as you can see here, I'm actually going to be using uh, Emacs fly check mode to run liquid Haskell on the file every time I save, so this is going to be updating in real time-ish. Um, so when I... Uh, <laughs> Uh, run liquid Haskell on this, that's safe, that's great. Um, and if I change it to 51, that should be bad. And indeed, we see, you get a little squiggly line that you can hopefully see, and a type error, 50 is not equal to 51. So let me put it back to 50. Uh, of course, this is kind of boring, but I can say other things about 50. I can say that it's, um, it is greater than or equal to zero, and it's strictly less than 100. And liquid Haskell says that that's okay. Um, now I'm gonna go ahead and pull out this, uh, this type and give it a name because we'll be uh, using types like this in, uh, throughout the talk. Uh, so specifically I'm going to define a type called range which takes a lower and an upper bound and it describes the type of the set of integers that are greater than the lower bound uh, and less than the, high, uh, the upper bound. And now I can come back here replace this large thing with uh, 50 has type range 0, 100 and again, you know, that's okay, but you know, obviously 500 outside of the range. So that's a really simple refinement type. Um, we can describe func uh, contracts of functions by refining the input, um, the input parameters and the output parameters with pre and post conditions respectively. So here's another simple function called, uh, called range that uh, is supposed to just create you know, a list of numbers in between the, the lower bound and the upper bound. Um, and so I want to actually say that it should, it should do that. So uh, low is going to be an integer. We have an, an upper bound called high, which is also an int. And we'll go ahead and say that it should be greater than or equal to low. Uh, and this thing should return a list of range low, high. Uh, oops, and we don't like that. Why don't we like that? Uh, oh, it's, ah, yes, of course, there's a... Um, type mismatch here. So um, I don't really want range to only apply to integers. It should really work for you know any kind of numeric type. So I'm going to replace the integer with an underscore telling Liquid Haskell that you know that's a type hole. Just query GHC for the actual um, you know Haskell level type of it when we uh, when we check the file to fill in the blanks. So again, I can run Liquid Haskell now on range, and it says, "Wait, this is not good." Um, specifically, low. I uh, tried to prove that low is strictly less than high, but we can only prove whoops, that uh, low is less than or equal to high. And that's, of course, because I've got the wrong guard here. Uh, so if I change that back to uh, strictly less than, the, uh, the error goes away <laughs> and Liquid Haskell verifies the function. Um, so we can actually say a little bit more about range. For example, if we note uh, the, exam uh, the uh, examples I have right here, uh, range 1-4 produces a list of three numbers. Range 1-1 one, one produces the empty list. So I want to say that the length of range low high is always going to be equal to high minus low. 
But how do I refer to the length of a list? Uh, so what we're going to do in Liquid Haskell, instead of, um, instead of defining a family of lists indexed by their length, we're going to define uh, what we call a measure, which I like to think of as a, a view of a data type. So I'm going to call this thing ln, because we actually already have a, a len in the standard uh, the Liquid Haskell prelude. Uh, and we write this more or less like a Haskell function, even though it's not actually a Haskell function. Um, but it looks similar. It's similar enough to say that, excuse me, the ln of nil is zero. The ln of x cons x is, is equal to one plus the uh, ln of x is. And now when Liquid Haskell sees this measure definition, it, gets, it gives us two things. Uh, one, it gives us an uninterpreted function symbol called ln, which we can refer to in our refinement types to actually reason about um, how lns are transformed by calling functions. Uh, the other thing, and the more importantly, it gives us, uh, it takes each of these equations and translates them into refined data constructors for nil and cons respectively. Um, so for example, if I make a little dummy list here, one cons nil, just so we can see the, uh, the types that, the, oh boy, the, uh, oh boy. Can people still read this? No. No, okay. Um, okay, and we got a little bit of a problem here with the, uh, um, the size of the boxes, but I'll read it to you. So it says uh, that cons takes an integer, a list of integers, and importantly, it returns a list of integers such that the, uh, the return list, is, null of the return list is, is uh, false. The length of the return list is one plus the length of the, the tail, and the, uh, oh, and the, the regular length is one plus the length of the tail. And so this shows off one of the really nice things about measures, which is that we can actually define multiple measures um, independently of the, the data definition, and Liquid Haskell actually just conjoins all of the, uh, the strengthened types into one super strengthened type. Uh, so it lets us separate the, the properties of data from the actual um, structure of the, the data itself. Um, but as I said, since we already have a, a length in the, the prelude, I'm just going to use that one. So coming back up here, let me go ahead and say that so the one in the prelude is defined just like this? It's exactly like this, yes, thanks okay. for There's nothing magic about that. No, no, no. Um, so now I'm going to say we're not, range is not going to give just any list of range low high. That's a bit confusing. Uh, it's going to return precisely a list of range low high such that the length of that list is equal to high minus low. And we want to run Liquid Haskell on it again, and as you can see, no errors flagged. So Liquid Haskell accepts this definition of range with the strength and type as is. And so that's a you know a very quick introduction to some simple refinement types with uh, measures. The really great thing about measures, as I said, is that they let us describe properties of, of um, data without actually embedding them into the da the data definition and into the type. And I think that that's uh, really useful. But sometimes you actually do want to embed the, uh, the property into the type so you can have a, uh, an invariant that should hold over every instance of the type. Uh, for example, if you have a, a type of CSV tables, we might want to say that the, uh, uh, the length of each row should be precisely the length of the, uh, the header row, which I've called calls here. So I can actually refine uh, the data definition itself using Liquid Haskell. And uh, I'm going to define a type alias to make that a little bit easier. So I'm going to define a type alias uh, for lists that have length n here. And uh, so this is just list of a such that the length of v is equal to n. And now I can come over here and say that instead of rows being a list of just any list of lists, so it's actually a list of, I'm probably going to need more space. It's going to be a list of list n a and len calls, which is saying that every list inside rows has to have exactly the same length as calls. Now in this uh, CS, um, sample CSV value I have here, that's of course okay, but if I remove the second element from the, the fed list, liquid Haskell immediately um, flags, ugh, Emacs is not behaving very well today, um, it flags a type error. Oh, that's a little bit easier to see. The, uh, you see there, there's a lot of stuff in the context here because of the sub-expressions, but the important thing is that it's uh, saying it couldn't prove that the lengths were equal. 
Uh, and of course, if I put that back in, uh, then it's able to prove what I, the, uh, the invariant. So uh, now I'm going to jump into the first benchmark that we worked on with Liquid Haskell, uh, which is proving functions total. <coughs> so I've got uh, the, the standard definition of head here without you know, like an explicit error case. And Liquid Haskell has already flagged it as bad. And it says that it tried to prove you know, something, something to do with false. Uh, and precisely what's going on there is that when, uh, when GHC translates the, the actual Haskell definition into its internal core representation, uh, it translates all of our partial pattern matches into total pattern matches with uh, various uh, error functions inserted in uh, for the undefined cases. For example, in this case, it, I think it uses pat error. So what we can do is we can give pat error a precondition of false which says that it is never safe to call pat error. Um, and then when we run liquid Haskell on it, of course, in this case, we don't at the moment know anything about head. Uh, and so liquid Haskell can't prove that uh, we'll never call pat error. But let's just go ahead and give head a proper type with a, a useful precondition saying that the, uh, the input list can't be empty, written like this. Oops. Oh, and of course, it needs to. Uh, return an A. And now when I rerun liquid Haskell, it's all okay. And uh, the reason this works is because when we come into this pattern match and come to the, the nil case in particular, we know based on the precondition for X is that it has to have length greater than zero. But based on the pattern match, we know that it has to have length equal to zero. And there's our contradiction. So therefore, this case can't ever happen. Um, but now for a more real world example of uh, proving totality, let me uh, jump into HS Color, which is a library for colorizing um, Haskell code. Uh, and this is some function from the uh, uh, inside HS Color that does something to do with uh, parsing nested comments. And again, Liquid Haskell has flagged it as a bad function because it's, uh, it's partial. Specifically, what's going on here, if we take a close look, we can see there are a bunch of cases uh, with a non-empty list, and n is greater than or equal to 0, and then one case where n is anything and the list is empty. So we're missing a case where, the, um, where n is negative and uh, the list is not empty. But it seems that, that n is referring to the nesting depth of the comment. So it doesn't really make any sense to have a negative nesting depth. So I'm going to go ahead and say that um, that we should only ever provide natural numbers to nest comment. And again, I'm going to use these uh, type holes to leave out the types for the, uh, for the other parameter and the return value because I don't actually have anything interesting to say about them at the moment. Um, and so now, immediately Liquid Haskell says that this function seems OK again. Uh, but note, this doesn't come for free. Now every time we call a nest comment, we have to prove that the first parameter is going to be greater than 0. In particular, uh, this case right here, uh, where we call nest comment with recursively with n minus 1, uh, we have to prove that, that uh, n minus 1 is still greater than 0. But of course, that's true because we have this helpful guard here saying that n should be greater, strictly greater than 0. Um, you might notice that we have two where clauses and a let, clause, a let, a, um, let in clause here. If that seems a little strange, ask me about it at the end of the talk or in the hallway. There's actually a, a fairly interesting answer um, to why that happens, or the, why, why we've written marks? it that way. What are the yellow question marks? Oh, the yellow question marks are, that's something else from Flycheck. That's like, um, I think that's HLint running. So it has nothing to do with Liquid Haskell. Um, so now uh, I'm running out of time, but I really want to show you uh, byte string because that was the motivating example, and we're going to uh, to show oops, memory safety in byte string. So first of all, a byte string consists of a pointer to a region of memory, <laughs> an offset into that region, and a length. And the crucial invariant that we want to ensure uh, for every uh, every instance of byte string is that the sum of the offset here and the length should never exceed the length of the pointer. And now by the length of the pointer, I mean the, uh, the number of bytes that are addressable from the current location the pointer <laughs> is pointing to. Uh, we can't compute that, but we can, we can define a measure <clears throat> that will let us refer to it uh, in our types. And we've called that fplint. It's also in the, the standard uh, liquid Haskell prelude. 
Uh, the thing about it is that we, uh, of course, we can't define any, we don't have any equations for this, uh, so we don't get refined data constructors, which means that we actually have to assume a few things about functions that manipulate foreign pointers. Uh, in particular, we have to assume that malloc does what you would hope it does and returns, you know, given some number n, it returns a pointer to n bytes of memory. But if we're okay at making that assumption, we can go ahead and start creating some byte strings manually. And you see, if I allocate five bytes and return a byte string with length five and offset zero, that's okay. If I try to uh, return a byte string with length six, that's not okay because six is greater than five. And I can say, you know, return a byte string with, with length three, but offset two, two plus three is equal to five, so that's still okay. But if I say two and four, that's not okay. Um, so this seems pretty nice, but of course no one actually creates byte strings like this except for deep inside the library <coughs> itself. Um, instead, they, um, the authors have provided a higher order function called create that does all the heavy lifting. So you give create um, the number of bytes you want to allocate and a callback function to actually fill in the blanks and uh, create allocates the memory and then calls the callback function. And uh, already Liquid Haskell is complaining about L because we haven't told anything about it. In particular, it, um, in order for the malloc call to be safe, we have said that it has to be greater than zero. So I'll go ahead and fill that in. So create is gonna take um, an L, which is a nat, oops, capital nat, uh, and it's going to take some callback function, which is gets a pointer, uh, word eight, and does some stuff in the IO monad, and uh, come down here, and it's going to return um, an IO, and I'm going to go ahead and, and say that it returns an IO of byte string n, which is um, a byte string with n bytes um, of L, so in, it, actually a byte string of, with L bytes. And now when we, we uh, rerun Liquid Haskell, all seems to be well, but it's not actually, um, because where we have this you know, arbitrary function that we're passing in, and uh, that could do, you know, we, we haven't said anything about what this function can do, so it seems like it could do um, anything. And uh, so in fact, using this definition, this type for create, uh, Liquid Haskell decides that it's not actually safe to do anything with the, uh, the pointer that the callback function gets, uh, because we have provided uh, a, a specification for poke here, which does the actual writing into memory, that says that the, uh, the pointer that you're trying to write to has to have a length of uh, strictly greater than zero, which means you have to have at least one byte addressable in order to safely write to that location. Um, and so we can't do anything useful with this at the, mo at the moment. We need to come back up here and say that uh, um, it doesn't get just any pointer word eight. It gets a pointer uh, word eight that has exactly L bytes of memory. And so now when I rerun this, um, Liquid Haskell decides that uh, this call to create is in fact okay. Um, but if I, instead, increment, instead of incrementing the pointer by four, increment it by 10 and then try to write that location, given that I've only allocated five bytes of memory, it is not safe to, to do that. Um, okay, and now this is actually all we need to do in order to prove that uh, the pack function is memory safe. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and give it a type. Uh, so pack takes a list of word aids and it returns a byte string n, so having uh, of len s. So that means it, a byte string uh, with the same number of bytes as there were words in the, uh, the list that we passed to it. And Liquid Haskell can actually prove that uh, the pack is memory safe and has this, uh, this uh, specification all on its own without any further annotations from the user, which is really great. Uh, and now really rushing to, uh, to wrap this up, uh, we have unsafe index, which was how we were indexing into it. Um, Liquid Haskell uh, is already complaining about something here to do with actually trying to read potentially out of bounds when we haven't said anything about the inputs. Uh, so let me go ahead and say that we give it, we're gonna give unsafe index a byte string and a, uh, <coughs> oops, an int 
that is uh, greater than zero and strictly less than the uh, B length of the byte string, and it returns a word eight. And now we're, Liquid Haskell is able to prove that, um, that unsafe uh, index actually has the right type. Uh, and furthermore, it's able to prove that, um, that our use here, where we call pack and then unsafe index into it at two, which is in, within bounds, is safe. But if I bump that up to three, that is no longer safe. And if I bump it up to something ridiculous, it is certainly not safe. Um, and that's the end of the demo. So coming back real quick, uh, we've seen, we, we can use Liquid Haskell to prove that functions satisfy their contracts. We can prove that functions are total, that they terminate, and that uh, they're memory safe. And the really nice thing is that the last three bullets on that list are all just instances of the first. Um, so we have a lot more details in our paper uh, and on our blog. Um, so I also have some, some graphs here, but I'm out of time, so I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, any questions are more than welcome, but please, uh, Try out our tool and break it and tell us how you broke it, because we would like people to actually use this. <laughs> Can you uh, send us the patches for uh, the byte string to actually add these annotations into the, the real library? Yeah, um, we should definitely do that. Uh, so I didn't get to talk about, like, a lot of our uh, versions are a bit older than the standard library, so we'll have to do some uh, rework to make sure we address any recent changes, but yeah, we should definitely do that. So you've sh shown us, oh, sorry. Um, okay. um, you're doing stuff that's like close to I.O., but um, I can't really imagine how these liquid types would look like if I were to say something about the content of an I.O. IO ref that might change over time. Um, do you support it anyway, or is it just not there yet? It's not there yet, yeah. Uh, we, we are interested in trying to address things like that and actually have some kind of story about stateful computations, but we don't have it yet. So um, you had uh, kind of one non-example where it couldn't figure something out, and then the constraints are, were pretty big. Um, is it hard to debug this stuff, or do you get used to it? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes and yes. <laughs> uh, it, it can definitely be a, a tricky thing to to get used to because it does infer the strongest possible types for all the sub expressions, and especially when you when you end up with a, a large context, it can get kind of um, overwhelming. Um, but one of the things that I've found uh, really helpful that Liquid Haskell does is, in addition to, um, it doesn't just you know dump dump out like a, a set of um, type binders. It actually, we actually uh, annotate the source code, uh, dump out an HTML file with uh, using hscolor, and then insert JavaScript pop-ups so you can uh, hover over all the, the sub-expressions and see what type we inferred. And uh, I've, like, personally, I found that invaluable when I was working through text in particular. Um, the other thing that we're, we're looking into in terms of trying to, uh, to ease the, uh, the, like, the reasoning about what's actually going on when Liquid Haskell can't prove something is we're, uh, we're looking at trying to, uh, to generate specific counterexamples um, by just generating a whole bunch of tests that satisfy the preconditions and then you know, see if we can find a, an empirical case where it fails. One last question. Uh, so, so you define your, your measure function in, in, a, in this funny comment. Mm -hmm. Could you have defined it as a, as a Haskell function and then said, use this Haskell function as the measure? Not at the moment. Um, so one thing I probably wasn't uh, quite clear enough about is that uh, measures, like I, I think I did say that they are, they are not Haskell functions, uh, but you can sort of think of them as a very, very restricted subset of inductively defined Haskell functions where you have one equation, um, that, uh, one equation per data constructor and you can only pattern match on one uh, data constructor because we are uh, translating this into, directly into uh, refined types for the data constructors. Um, so you can, but as you saw, especially with length, the definition looks identical to the actual Haskell definition of length. So one thing that we are interested in doing is trying to identify, uh, you know, a subset of actual Haskell functions that we could just, you know, treat as measures. But we haven't done be, that yet. That'd be nice, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Let's thank our speaker again. Next up, we have Lee Pike, who is going to tell us about smart.